guys, and welcome back for another episode of the Social Hour Podcast, a podcast for sewist by sewist. I'm your host, Ashley. And I'm your host, Bethany. And on today's episode, we have Amanda joining us. Hi, Amanda. Oh, hi, I'm excited Yay. to be here. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. So for those who don't know, which would probably be everybody listening right now, is Amanda's actually one of my colleagues um, at work, and we get to work together on singer stuff and ditto stuff. And so we're I'm excited to have her on because Amanda does a lot more than what I see at work, and I've started to learn a little bit more about that, and I'm really excited to just get to know about your sewing experience outside of work, because you've done quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I have quite you, a journey to share. So. I know. I know. You sent your bio over, and I was messaging Ashley last night, and I was like, um... I didn't know this about her. Like, this is really cool. Like, this is super fun. I'm glad we're doing this. And um, if you wouldn't mind um, kind of giving people a little synopsis of who you are, what you do, and then we'll dive into like all you've done. <laughs> sure. So yeah, I'm Amanda. Um, I've been sewing since forever. Like a lot of people, I have that story where my mom was a yeah. sewist. She made my clothes. She quilted. Uh, she still quilts. Yep. Um, and she more or less got me into it just because there was a machine and there was fabric all around, but it wasn't mm -hmm. until middle school and high school that I really started kind of sewing on my own. Um, and I got into theater. So a lot of that was because I was really shy as a kid, hmm. um, super shy, wouldn't talk to anyone. And it was suggested to my parents that I try drama club. And nothing gets you out of your shell, like being around a bunch of theater kids, like in mm -hmm. high school. Um, so I kind of fell in love with that. And I should not be acting or singing or dancing. Uh, so I got into costume design. I uh, love it. I went, yeah. And I uh, went to school for it. Uh, I went to Rutgers University. I have a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in costume design and construction from Mason Grove School of the Arts. That's super um, cool. They and literally been... like pushed you into the deep end, didn't they? Sure <laughs> but did. like, look yeah. what it led you to do. Like that was exactly. a huge thing. So thanks, yeah. mom and dad. So <laughs> you never, you never know how things go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I have been in costumes uh, since I left college, um, and just recently, about a year ago, I joined um, with Bethany, the SVP team, and now I'm a full-time educator. So I still do a little bit of costume design um, and costume construction on the side, but I've kind of shifted focus and um, I've done, well, I'm sure we'll get to it, but during the pandemic was a big shift for me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You had shared that with me before and we had another guest last year that d used to do a lot of costuming and stuff for shows and for mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. other things. And she said the same thing. Like mm -hmm. it really just shut down her industry and she had to really shift gears, but still utilize the talent she had kind of like you've done. So, um, I know you're not the only one that went through that. Um, yeah, you but don't you... realize that theater was the first to shut down and the last to come back. So wow. yeah, we had to get really creative with what we were doing. And that was for years. Oh. Uh, yes, I I didn't have a job for a year and a half, but I got really creative, and it, luckily I relied on my side hustles and mm -hmm. uh, you know getting creative with my skills, and it actually really yeah. worked out really well. Good. And I think I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for that and all the things I got to test out while you know I couldn't mm -hmm. do what I was used mm -hmm. to. Yeah. So. <laughs> there were a lot of people that leaned on those side hustles during that period. I know during 2020, I mean, I was a recruiter before mm -hmm. I worked where we work now. So I like nobody was hiring, everybody was letting people go. So first people to get cut is recruiters. And the mm. last people to bring back are recruiters. So I went about a year without a job and I had to get really creative. And it was my crafts that pulled me through that year. And mm, um, really? it, it'll, man, it's not easy <laughs> making oh. a side hustle your main hustle abruptly. Yeah. Um, and during a pandemic and everything shut down, it was crazy. It was absolutely yeah. crazy. You have come on the other side of that, but mm -hmm. I would love to maybe talk about your life before that pandemic. And um, one of the things that you sent over in your little bio, and, and for those who haven't seen our description, that's where you can read Amanda's full bio, but we're going to talk about some of the things she shared with us in that, because um, I did not realize that you were a costume shop manager and had 
done costuming for over a hundred theatrical productions. Like that is astonishing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know more about like that world because I'm not I've not been a part of that world, and it's just fascinating. Yeah, it's crazy and it's fast paced, and mm -hmm. um, I, I honestly don't know the number, but I can like off exactly how many I've worked on. But you know, uh, when you're a shop manager, usually a theater season is nine months. You do six to nine shows in that season. Uh, and then I was also a shop manager for a summer program where we would do six, seven shows in wow. eight weeks. Oh my gosh. Um, so it's very fast paced. And then I was designing on the side. So there's a handful of shows that I would do at other theaters. So I was, you know, doing at least, or had my hands in at least one to two shows a month for, um, you know, I was a shop manager for over 10 years. Um, so that's a a lot that's of a shows. lot of shows. Yeah, yeah. So when you're doing these shows, I mean, every show has custom made, designed it, costumes specific to that show and the mm -hmm. people playing those characters, right? Yeah, it depends. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of variations. If you are doing like a smaller community show, there might be a cast of like four or five. And you're going to, if it's modern, you might be shopping that show completely and just mm. doing alterations. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a historical piece, then you're kind of building everything or um, yeah. renting it because it doesn't exist. Mm. Um, so as a designer, you're doing a lot of the creative, like, this is what I want it to look like. And as mm -hmm. a shop manager, you're doing a lot of, this is how I'm going to make it happen. Mm. And I loved that aspect of like, here's the problem I need to solve. You gave me <laughs> pictures and now I need to either find it or build it. Yeah. Um, and probably so on a very tight budget. Yeah. It depends <laughs> where you are. I mean, I've worked on a range of like very tiny shows that maybe my budget was like $50. And then I've worked bigger shows where mm -hmm. it's thousands upon thousands of dollars. Yeah. And you just go about it differently. Mm -hmm. Um, and you get, you, you get creative. I like a challenge. Um, so yeah, it's, it's wild, but you kind of just fine. go towards each one differently and you just kind of see what happens. Is there yeah. like a favorite show that you've done or a favorite costume that you've been a part of, like production that you're like, this one really stands out for me in my mind of one of my um, faves? Depends. So I love building things that are weird and complicated. Uh, so two summers ago, I did, I designed SpongeBob the musical, which is by far one of my favorites. And I don't know if any, if you don't know the show, uh, or if you my know, favorite. you know, SpongeBob, I had a SpongeBob car, like literally. So I was super, when they said they were, I was the shop manager and I was designing it. And when they said we're doing SpongeBob, I was like, I have to, because I am, if, if there is glitter, if there is color, if there is spectacle, if there is special effects. That's over the dad. top yeah, yeah, like yeah. If, if you need to wear a feather headdress and 50 people are matching in hot pink that's i want to do that um <laughs> so spongebob has squidward in it who obviously he has multiple he's a squid he has multiple legs and i have to say building those legs and <laughs> pants to fit a four-legged person is uh <laughs> very complicated yeah. but a really good time um, yeah, that's fun. There's not a bonus but, block for that. <laughs> no, there's not. That was like straight up engineering there. And yeah. uh, I had a blast. Um, that's so cool. Yeah. Cool. And if you check out my website, you can see pictures of it. Um, but I, I want to share more. Something about being in costumes and the fast pace is I rarely shared what I was working on because I was just mm -hmm. making stuff. You're in the moment. Stuff out. So like I'm trying, I want to, my goal for 2024 is to share more of what I'm doing uh, cause there's nothing out there about those legs that I built, but I have a <laughs> video of it. So at yeah. some point I will share it. We need to see that for sure. Yeah. And we'll definitely add some photos into our video. Uh, we'll put them on our blog post for this episode so you can see what we're talking about and some of, cause we can get some photos, yeah. but, um, yeah, that's, that's wild. Those legs and are I, built out of like PVC pipe and yeah. pool noodles and like, <laughs> So I, I can share you pictures of that. <laughs> I would love to see that. And you even said that, like, you enjoy, like, doing the special effects and mm -hmm. making costumes suitable for, like, quick changes right off 
stage or um you know integrating like lights i think you said when have you done that that's super cool yeah so um with the quick changes one of my favorite shows is called souvenir and it's a one or two people but basically one woman show and she changes 23 times in like an hour <gasps> oh, wow. oh my gosh by far one of my favorite shows to costume and design because it's just like look how fun we're how much fun we're having oh my um, gosh. But with the lights uh, my husband is a lighting designer, so um, hmm. we we get to collaborate whenever we do, whenever I get to do a lighting project. So I've done at this point three lighting costumes for various theaters, and I always bring him on <laughs> to help me. <laughs> uh, we did one time we did um, when we were doing Peter Pan, our Tinkerbell was actually a pair of gloves with a really like bright LED in the mm -hmm. fingertip and multiple people wore it so you could throw the light and someone would catch it oh, um, uh -huh. and it looked like tinkerbell was like you know flying to different people so that was oh, one we had cool. a really good time um i did a star costume for winter wonderettes and um that one was just a full star when she jumped she was like star shaped mm. and full lighting so that one was really fun um Again, I'm getting all theater nerdy with my musicals. Oh, but... no, we love it. We love <laughs> um, it. Yeah. Uh, Gypsy also has Electra as a light up uh, costume. So we've done that. It was like a bikini with um, lightning bolts all <laughs> <laughs> on it that lit up. So, yeah, a lot of fun with stuff like that. And again, I love that challenge of like yeah. and the technology of lighting for costumes is getting better and better like mm -hmm. there's a lot of fun before the it was like this smaller. super yeah it used to be this super bulky thing mm -hmm. um when we did again this gypsy costume when we did electra and this the lights all over the front she had to wear a giant battery pack on her back oh, yeah, and it I was bet. she was again wearing heels and like the battery pack was too heavy so we had to like so battle it like center of balance right yeah <laughs> but over. now like you can get that was years ago but now you can get battery packs that are like she could have we could have just put it in the bra so yeah. like the technology is getting really cool and there's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. um to play with there so That's always super down cool. for things like that yeah that's yeah, awesome. I just wanted to mention, though, um, when you said that your parents pushed you into drama, you know, mm -hmm. I never would have thought to bring like to, to, to enter that world as a creative. And I know that sounds crazy, but like I'm not into drama and I did drama for one class. But I never thought, like, if I would have just stayed with it, then maybe I could have designed stuff and I could have been part of the costuming. You, you know you what I mean? Been here sooner. And even that just that little bit of information is like, oh, my goodness, like, I'm going to tell my kids to do that because yeah. you can still get into it, even if you're like, you could it's do never it right too now, late. actually. It's too late. <laughs> never too late. No, it's not too late, because if you I, I'm going to say this for anyone listening who's intrigued by costume design or like wants to get in it and they're like i don't know how um shops are always looking for people who can sell really it is it's so a, hard yeah. to find as a shop manager i would have such a hard time finding people who could sell hmm. um so if you're interested in it reach out to local theaters and just say hey i can sell i'd love to work on your shows um you do not need to be like the best sewist mm -hmm. you need to look good on the outside uh, exactly. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that you sew at theaters mm -hmm. is alterations. So mm -hmm. when I interview someone, I will ask, do you know how to put in a zipper? Do you know how to blind him to hem a pair of pants? Can you take in a side seam? If you can do those, you can, you can sew in my shop. The there, job. Will be, <laughs> there will be things. Of course, we also hire, like theaters are going to hire people that can build tailors and build full garments. But sure. if you know the basics, mm -hmm. uh, you can work in a shop mm -hmm. um so yeah, and that's cool and they're probably that's... very willing to train you on things and help you the first couple of times to figure out like how things work because one of the videos that you posted the other day and i sent it to ashley i said i said i love how she shares how she's adding a seam allowance to a custom drafted pattern piece but even then you said you know then you have control over how much seam allowance and you even said up to two inches which makes it great for altering for costumes mm -hmm, and I just mm -hmm. didn't even think about that. Like you may have a costume that this character, this person is playing this character, but maybe, you know, 
they get hurt or they move on to another show and they've got their backup comes in, but they're fitted different. But you can take in and let out because you've got two extra inches or more yeah. of seam allowance and built into that garment. Those are things that as garment sewists, we want our seams to be as small as possible. But, I, you know, it's just a different way of thinking about it in yeah. that regard. Well, theater is all a facade and so are the costumes. <laughs> like the insides are wild. Right, um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the point is, is that you can adjust them and a lot of these things get saved. So like places yeah. will have a stock and you reuse mm -hmm. items a lot. Mm -hmm. And it is a lot of taking it apart and making it fit someone else. Um, I got really good at fitting all kinds of body types too, which I oh, yeah. am really mm -hmm. proud of. Like that's a great part of costume design it's is you're skill. fitting all different types of people, all different shapes of people. Yeah. Um, you know, that would be really cool Ashley to get that exposure because we're so used to just adjusting patterns for our own bodies right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as like garment so as for just ourselves or our kids or whatever but it's like to get exposure mm -hmm. in like that to so many different body types body shapes men women and children um that's mm -hmm. that would be a wealth of knowledge I can yeah. see how that would be really helpful because there's nothing better than like actually doing it for someone else but then like, it's different. It takes some of the pressure off, I guess, maybe, or maybe it doesn't. But I kind of think like if I was, if someone came to me and said, can you make me that same coat but to fit me? I would be like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know your body. <laughs> I, I, um, you know, or the dress or whatever. It's like, I, I know how to make it for me, you know? So, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. you get nervous about making a custom garment that they're paying for and they hope that it fits them and you're not used to fitting their body. So I could see how that skill set, learning it with costumes and oh, knowing yeah. that there's wiggle room in costumes, right? <laughs> that that makes it a little easier, but I just, I don't know. I'm sure it's very nerve wracking to design these costumes and adjust well, you, get, you get used to it over time. <laughs> Again, as someone who's never done any of that, it, I could see how that knowledge can be so beneficial for what, yeah. even just what I do. The that doesn't mean that also... I want to start making custom clothes for people. Don't take that as a... No, I do. Yeah. I, I work through theaters where I make things for myself. I, especially around Halloween. Like, I'm not making your Halloween costume. Oh, yeah. I'm I not bet. having your pants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. That's too funny. I love that. Yeah, I'm, I always say that, too. I'm like, no, I want him you your pants. You make a shirt. We do. I'm not making your Halloween costume. That's your shirt. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> yes, I so. No, I won't hem your pants. Yeah. <laughs> no, I won't alter your clothes. There is a big difference between alterations and sewing from scratch. And I oh, feel like time. people don't realize they think, oh, you're a sewist or you sew. That doesn't mean that I have the skill set of mm. alterations. It's a different mm -hmm, beast mm -hmm. entirely. It really is. It really yeah. I do not work with beading or like if someone wants me to alter something with beading or applique. No, I am <laughs> not doing it. Can you uh, have my wedding scared. dress? Yes. Mm -hmm. I am, when I get contacted about wedding dresses, I'm like, how many layers is it? Is there any beads? If the answer is yes to either of these questions, I'm sorry. Like, go somewhere else. <laughs> I cannot there's, help. There's professionals for a reason. Mm -hmm. And they charge that much for a reason. So, and it's so stressful. It's so it stressful. It is so oh, stressful. they're one day. Yeah. Right? One freaking day, you know, and everyone's looking at them. And yeah, you better get it right or they're going to mm -hmm. hate you forever. <laughs> yeah, you can't really like, can we like get another one and fix it or redo it? Yeah. Nope, it's mm -hmm. got to be one and done. And <laughs> yeah. there's so many elements to those kind of garments. I had someone ask me to do like a prom dress but it was like a fitted mermaid and it was beaded and i was like or sequins or something i was like uh no and they're like well it's just a little bit and i'm like mm, it may be um but that hem to come up on the front it's got a little bit of a train around the back so you've got to actually taper that and then it's it's sequins and beads like no you can't just sew through that like it's so it's so much more and then there was a layer underneath with like tool and I was mm -hmm. like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Even when I when I was trying on wedding dresses, I tried on a mermaid dress that had like mm -hmm. this beautiful scallop hem. Ooh. And my friends were like, oh, my God, this dress is perfect on you. You have to wear it. And I turned to the woman. And I said, how do you hem this? Mm -hmm. How do you hem the scallop? And I realized like they would have to take it in through the waist. And I was yes, like, I don't want to yeah. deal with any of this. I was like, no, put me in a different dress. Yeah. <laughs> 
So but I bet they've never way. had anyone else ask that question. That's I'm, yeah, they were probably like, oh, what? Like, why, why is this a concern of yours? Like, nobody ever asks these questions about how to alter this, or is it going to be hard? And nobody ever makes a decision on a dress based on that. But but someone like you would yeah. think of I that. ended up, my wedding dress, I ended up, it was beaded on the bodice, and I actually had someone else do it, because I mm -hmm. was like, I don't do beads. But I did, um, I hemmed it myself. So. Ooh. <laughs> was that your wrecking? The, <laughs> the day before? Like, the day or two before my wedding. It, it was... <gasps> I had a ball gown, but it was all tool, so I just had to cut okay. it. I had it mm -hmm. on a tool, on a form, and I was just cutting each layer. That's um, cool. Are you, like, bodice. sweating bullets? And you're like, if this gets too short, I'm wearing slides. <laughs> I'm wearing no, flat I felt, shoes. I felt confident in that. Okay, so. good. <laughs> you're literally coming at your wedding dress with scissors. I did. Yeah. You're wrecking. Oh, my gosh. I don't know <laughs> if I could do that. Um, so... I, you know, can you kind of walk us through, like, when you kind of mentioned, like, going through the pandemic and how your career shifted, and I would love to kind of maybe know if you're, if you want to share kind of how you made the decision of going from such a freelance kind of corp, like, non-corporate world to switching into working for SVP and becoming their ditto educator and working with the singer brand and, um, and where, what made you kind of decide to shift gears in that way? Yeah. So, you know, pandemic hit and everyone went home <laughs> and, uh, my company, luckily the theater I worked at kept me on, um, for a few months mm -hmm. and kind of gave me, <laughs> gave all of us in the production department, some odd jobs like for a while i was just making masks for people mm -hmm. yeah um, so i was making masks for other employees that kept me busy and then we were like you know doing paperwork tickets to, like helping in any way we could and then mm -hmm. it got to the point where they were like all right you're we're not making any shows you can't yeah. like we can't keep you on this isn't anymore. just a short term pandemic yeah. this is sticking around for a while so so they let us go and um i had a lot of free time on my hands and uh for a while i just played a lot of animal crossing <laughs> and just like put them off and was like you the rest of the process world. you have to process yeah. that because that's like a traumatic thing because you you this has been your world for so long and your kind of identity and your passion and then for that to just get cut off it's like what what do I do with my hands? What do I do with myself? Yeah. You know? So so there was a little bit of that, but there was a lot of mask making, and I actually mm -hmm. designed my own mask pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, and my husband, because he's a lighting designer and knows all those vector programs, he helped me draft it and make it a PDF. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized I wanted to do that, and I was like, why can't I make a PDF? Mm -hmm. So I started learning Illustrator and. Um, just I joined Skillshare and I was like learning Illustrator and I noticed on Skillshare there was classes on fabric design and how to make fabric repeats. Mm. Um, so I actually learned more or less because I was like, oh, that's the cooler part of Illustrator. So I actually learned Illustrator through learning how to do fabric repeats. That's super um, cool. So, yeah, I kind of just pivoted by accident. Like it was just like, you know, as creatives, we are always wanting to learn. I am oh, yeah. always I'll see someone online like tufting a rug and then I'm like, I want to make a rug. Yeah. Oh, I so wanted to learn how to do that. But it's <laughs> oh my gosh, that so, like, machine is like cool. So satisfying to watch. And then they shave it down. Yes. And they, I'm like, sign me up for this. But I need to find like someone who does it and teaches a class because there's a I trust me. I went to start priced too. it out yeah. of how much to get all the stuff because it's not small stuff. And I was like, yeah. This is probably going to be one of those crafts where I make one or two and then I'm kind of over it because yeah. I knew I didn't want to get into it to like make a bunch and sell them. Yeah. And so it's not one of those crafts that you can just like pick up as a side hobby. And how many yeah. rugs does the house need? Right? <laughs> anyway, so like I want to do it. I'm such a learner and like I just want to <laughs> learn things. So learn fabric design, learn illustrator. And yeah. that was kind of like that's what I did during the pandemic. I would just like make repeat patterns all day hmm. and like um i had you know i have a spoon flower shop yes that's um, all. so that was kind of my big focus is just like drawing on my ipad and making them repeats on illustrator teaching myself illustrator um and then i kind of was like how do i take this to the next level um and during all this i was teaching virtually because i teach you know 
how to sew um, through some universities and things like that. So they mm -hmm. were still, luckily enough, I was taking on stuff like that. Um, so I um, was like, how do I take this to the next level of fabric design? And I started looking for classes and um, there is a woman named Shannon McNabb who um, is a surface pattern designer, fabric designer, and she has some fantastic classes. And hmm. I found her on Skillshare, um, learned how to do, you know, took some of her classes for repeats. And then she actually has two classes. One is about pitching your portfolio to companies and how you get your art in front of people. That's and cool. then she has another class that's all about contracts and negotiations. Ugh. Um, I feel like that's the hardest part sometimes. It's like, I've got the talent or I've got the skills, but now what? Like. The, yep. the business side of being a creative, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Anyone, even if you're not into fabric design, her classes are fantastic and will give you the confidence to just start talking to companies. So I actually put a fabric design, surface design portfolio together. I added stuff to my website. And then I just started cold emailing companies, hmm. my designs, and just being like, hey, I'm a fabric designer. Do you want these? Mm -hmm. And I actually got a license through um, Ink and Arrow QT Fabrics wow, that's for awesome. a design. And that was a wild process because a lot of times when you design fabrics, you design them in collections mm -hmm. and fabric companies want to produce a collection. Well, the one they landed on was a one-off design. It was just, a. I had done it for, I think it was a spoon flower challenge, but I did, <laughs> it was just cats coming out of like gift boxes. <laughs> which is definitely my style like I love like little animals and cutesy stuff and uh so I did that and they were like we like this one does this one have a collection and I was like no it doesn't have a collection and they were like cool can you make it a collection in the yeah. next few weeks and I was like yes yes I can <laughs> sure <laughs> so like for two I was like frantically making designs and I you know basically pitched them I, I think I had like maybe 18 different patterns to go mm. along with this one and they picked their favorite I think like nine wow. maybe I was gonna ask um, how many patterns or fabric designs are in a collection typically mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it depends I honestly don't remember like the you usually have like a hero print then you have like mm -hmm. two or three like sub prints and then you mm -hmm. have a bunch of little coordinates and those will mm -hmm. be like your polka dots and mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. that i actually have let me see if i can find some of these fabrics i don't even i don't know where i have to find the, the gift box one um but this was like a coordinate that i made with it so it's like these little uh -huh. hats coming out of plants Oh, that's so my cute. style too. And then <laughs> some of these were like some of the simpler prints. Oh yeah, they'll, those they'll are just a little outline of the cat head. Yep. Yeah, so they'll just so do this in like cute. various colors. So you kind yeah. of um, mm -hmm. you kind of like add to it, and you do some simpler prints, and then some more complex prints. But yeah, I threw it all together really quickly, and they were fantastic to work with. And they actually like adjusted some colors for me, and like really walked me through the process. Um, that's awesome. And then I want to say it's like. It's a long process. Once yeah, you like submit it, it's like another eight months until your collection is released. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because um, they have to do, go through all the what? testing of the printing and then the full printing and like uh -oh. all their stuff on their side. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, so you just like don't hear anything for months and months. And months <laughs> You're months. like, uh. <laughs> uh. And then it's released. And then, um, you, and then you just start really receiving some royalty checks and like that's nice it's very exciting <laughs> <laughs> i would imagine so and i pulled up your spoon flower because i used to order a lot of fabric from spoon flower when i had my pet bandana business mm -hmm. and i used to look for some really creative designs um the ones that were always really popular were food mm -hmm. for like yeah. dog bandanas so you have some really cute food ones but i found one of sewing cats and this is adorable. It's sewing machines with cats on them, and they're just laying all over the sewing machines, and it's so cute. Those are so I have stickers of those on my Etsy <gasps> shop, and that's like one of my top sellers is my cat. Is stickers. it? Oh well, uh, most, yeah, yeah. A lot of people who sew. I'll have send you guys cats. one. <laughs> oh my gosh, 
I met one of Amanda's cats yesterday before her live Michael's class for work. And it was so cute because I was like, what are you taking a picture of while we were preparing for the Zoom to start? And she's like, oh, my cat is sticking his paws under the door because he wants to be in the room. But I locked him out. So she went and got him. Ashley has a very large kitty. Oh, yeah, very yes. a, main, a main coon. So she's oh, I love she's main coon. Probably, if you put her on my sewing machine, she would engulf it. Probably. Wow. Yeah, yeah. She, that's my dream to have a main coon one day. Love them. It, she's bigger than my dog. dog. <laughs> she acts like a, main coons act like dogs too. They she goes out to pee with the dog. Really? Like, yeah, she is not really a cat. Wow. She yeah. sent me a video. And a dog, so. Yeah, and they go you do together have together in the morning. Like, oh literally. My God, that's so cool. It's funny. I get, oh my gosh, get, I want one even more. <laughs> we get videos of Kitty. What's Kitty's real name? I can never remember. Molly. Molly. But we just call her Kitty or Fat Kitty. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> she's so big. But Ashley will send us like videos or photos of her sometimes. There was one photo or video that you sent where she was like draped over the arm of the couch. And it's like a big arm couch, like side of the. And it's like she's the whole arm of the couch. She just like puddles over the side. But yeah. then yesterday you sent a video, I think it was last night, where she was trying to walk under like your new lighting post, your pole for your lighting, your tripod. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, she couldn't, she tried to walk through the, the spindles at the bottom, but she was getting stuck between them and the whole light started to move with her. <laughs> I was like, Sorry, wishful thinking, kitty, but we don't fit. <laughs> like, She's like, because my face fits, she thinks her gut fits. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. She's so funny though, because she's just a she's puddle massive. of a fluff. She's, like, she's just a puddle. It's so funny. And I'm not really a, a cat person, but I and I've never met Kitty in person, but I love her because she's just so weird. And she's, yeah, she's got like a like, she's got a cool um, personality. No shame, you know, she just lays mm -hmm. there with her like legs spread and she just like <laughs> you know, she doesn't care. And she weighs how much? She's, oh, probably like twenty four pounds. That's 10 more pounds than Biscuit sitting right here next yeah, to me. She's a big wow. turkey. Mm -hmm. She is. And that's only a few more pounds and less I than don't, my big dog. I, and I have to t have to say this because people think that I am a, an irresponsible kitty owner and I give her treats and stuff. And I'm like, she's been on diet food her entire life because I know that Maine Coons get fat. Mm -hmm. And I do not give her treats. Period. She just eats her cat food. And, and I'm she's like, I just, don't know why she's so she's big. Just big boned. Yeah, she's just big. I've got a big one. Too. He's 15 pounds and he's always <laughs> been on a diet and he's always right. like we have one of those food poles that like limits how much he's allowed to eat. Yes. And I think when he turned about eight, the vet was like, You did your best. I think this is just <laughs> what he is. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> the pressure was finally off. They were like, he's just you did your best. So. That is yeah, too I, funny. I, like literally, though, I've had people say, "Like, well, it's the treats." I'm like, I don't give. It's her not treats. the treats. It's not it's not the treats. It's got a bad <laughs> metabolism. Okay. <laughs> well, Aww. it's funny because we were talking yesterday before the Zoom that like it's just so common for creative people to have a pet. Oh yeah. As part of their like creative space, right? Mm -hmm. Like we make a space for them in our creative space because mm -hmm. you know they're just always there. My dogs have. And we're not no. alone in a sleep room for eight with hours. Us. Yeah, like they have <laughs> that's their own space. Reason, that's another reason why I don't want to do alterations for people because I'm like, this is a pet friendly zone. Oh, yes, yeah. You can't handle having cat hair all over your suit or your <laughs> wedding dress. You can't bring it here. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's no. true. Mm -hmm. That is true. So that's so true. Well, um, yeah, I just I think it's super cute that you like put your cats into your fabric love designs love and so you're drawing from the things that interest you because i was going to ask you like how do you where do you get inspiration for this because i've learned how to do the repeat designs through procreate on my ipad i took a class and um but then i was like well where do i get my inspiration like where do i mm. where do you come like there's all of your designs are so different i love the hawaiian flowers with the hidden kitty cats in the middle like i'm just scrolling through it's just the cutest things cats with wine why not you know like yeah but i just i don't know i just don't sometimes i, I get a little creative block when it comes to that because you're you're creating from scratch yeah in this regard I I'd say like half my designs come for obviously things I just like, like wine mm -hmm. and cats and <laughs> sewing machines and cats. 
Um, so a lot of it is just things I like that. And I think that comes through. Like if you like what you're drawing or what mm-hmm. you're making, like it's just going to turn out better. Um, so there's that, but also like, I will do a lot of the spoon flower challenges or a mm-hmm. lot of other designers will like do like monthly challenges, especially around the holidays. They'll do, um, like if you follow some other fabric designers, mm-hmm. they'll do like a design a day or a doodle a day and they'll give you prompts. Um, okay. And something so just, to like inspire your design, like some, uh, Shannon yeah. McNabb, she does like, um, a lot of, uh, prompts and like kind of evergreen designs, things that will mm-hmm. always be popular mm-hmm. based on things. Cause she's, she's licensed a, a lot. Mm-hmm. And so she kind of knows like, you know, Santa is always popular. Christmas trees mm-hmm. are always popular. So like Gnomes. she'll give you a <laughs> lot of design ideas that are, you know, will always be popular. So mm-hmm. I'd say like spoon flower challenges or like follow other designers who mm-hmm. are doing these challenges just to give you ideas. And you don't have to yeah. do all of them. Like, Mm-hmm. Um, it gets you to think outside the box, I guess. Yeah, some of my favorite stuck designs stuck are from challenges that like I wasn't excited about, and then like I'm really proud of how it turned. And I'm like, oh, it no. pushes you as a creative, right? Like out yeah. of your comfort zone. I, mm-hmm. Are you a like? Have you been like identified yourself as an artist? Like you did the the sewing stuff, but have you always been like drawing and stuff as well? Yeah. So, and to add to my other list of things okay. that I've done. So I'm like, am school, I able to do this? Or like, I don't yes. usually draw a lot. So. <laughs> so yeah, I drew as a kid. That was again, being very shy. I loved a coloring book. I lo- I would just be the kid that I wanted my mom to buy me art supplies. Mm-hmm. And so I would always be in my room, just drawing and doodling. I got really into like, remember Sculpey clay. I loved making little yes. creatures out of Sculpey. <laughs> Um, and wildly enough in high school, so I did a lot of fine arts in high school. Um, and I actually got into woodworking and I did a bunch of like wood sculptures. Um, so I've always been like a very fine arts background. Mm -hmm. And when I was figuring out college, I was like, again, in theater, in drama club, but didn't realize I could like make a career out of it. So I was like, Mm -hmm. I can't do theater for life. Yeah. Um, and so I considered just because I liked art, I was going to go to school for graphic design just because mm-hmm. I was like, I think mm-hmm. that's what you do when you like art. That was like the only thing it's I could so think of. It's so hard at that age to, when you don't understand like the real world to decide like which path is going to take you. Like mm-hmm. when you think of like art, like, um, like doing like the, oh, what were you calling it? I'm sorry. Sculpey? I just had a brain fart. No. Um, like plays and stuff, drama club. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Why yeah. I couldn't say drama club right now? I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> like when I think of that, and when most people think of that, they probably think that you're performing, you're singing, you're acting, you're dancing. And not everybody mm. wants, but there's so much that goes into making those things happen and behind the scenes that you don't have to be the outgoing performance or can carry a tune to be a part of drama club. And you realize that when you kind of get put into it and learn that you can, well, I like to sew and they need costumes. Like, you wouldn't have thought to go into that with that mindset. You probably just assumed like most people that you have to sing and dance, you know, yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So, so I went it's to... learning to look at things differently or looking behind the main facade, right? Exactly. Like I, so I went, I actually applied and got into Savannah College of Art and Design and I went for graphic design and about six months in, I was like, this is so wrong. This is, <laughs> I hate this. I miss theater. I miss my theater friends. What am I doing? So I actually dropped out of school and moved home and like got a job at a steakhouse. And while I like reapplied for school yep. and I ended up going to Rutgers for costume design. Wow. Um, so it just goes to show like you, you can, you can do whatever. And like, I think one of the, the silver lines of the pandemic for me is like, I, I was kind of, I still love costume design, but I was kind of stuck in it. And I wouldn't have realized that there's other things I could do with my skills Mm -hmm. until I was forced out of it. So like, I would have never designed my own fabrics. I wouldn't be an educator now if I hadn't like been forced to be like, oh, you sew, but I can't do the thing I've been doing with that skill this whole time. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is what we do the same process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's true. You were doing something completely not creative um yeah no Mm -hmm. i uh as a recruiter in uh talent acquisitions for 10 years and 
staffing. I just sounds awesome. It was so not. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm a hey, people no, person. Nothing against any jobs. Like no. I know if you want to be a dental hygienist. If you want to be a recruiter, like be you. <laughs> yeah. Um. But as a creative, like it was a means to an end. And I was a people person. I'm very outgoing, so I did excel in it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't love it. I wasn't passionate about it. I wasn't like. If someone said, like, what do you do? I wasn't, that wasn't my answer mm -hmm. because I just paid my bills. Like, my answer is, like, right. what do I do for fun? My hobbies, because mm -hmm. that's what I really care about. And because my job didn't define me mm -hmm. because I didn't, I wasn't like proud of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, and that's you just me. If you want to yeah, be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but again, the pandemic forced me out of that career path that yeah. I was stuck in for so long because I had grown in it. Mm -hmm. you know and so you kind of get stuck in that path and when those things happen it, it's fight or flight right and so mm -hmm. we just mm -hmm. buckled down and was like well i gotta put a roof over my family's head i've got to put food on the table what what skills do i yeah. have that i can hone into that are still relatable to this world that we're in right now and that's mm -hmm. what i did that's what you did and if i hadn't done that and been sharing my epoxy tumblers and my woodworking and my sewing and my bandana business all online in the late hours of me going live on Facebook because I was bored by myself stuck in a house because I'm a people person. I was doing lives all the time. And that is how Sonny found me and saw me doing these and watched me for nine months wow. before she reached out and said, I have an opening. I mean, I met her at a 4th of July cookout because of a friend. And then I didn't talk to her again for nine months when she reached out because she'd been watching me the whole time and I didn't know. Wow. And I'm just like doing my thing, trying to survive. Excellent. And she's like, okay, well, she's very present online and she can teach and she loves sharing her passions and she's very like professional about it. And, um, and that's how I ended up. And I would have never known. I didn't even know that like Singer's headquarters was in my backyard. <laughs> so I didn't even know that there was opportunities there until mm -hmm. that moment it's just like that divine intervention mm -hmm. you just mm -hmm. never know what can happen Sometimes if you just put process. yourself <laughs> put yourself out there and just see where it takes you and again you never know who's watching mm -hmm. yeah. so keep that in mind for everything <laughs> or, and it, you never know if like a skill you have is going yeah. you're going to fall in love with it or you never know like what opportunities will lead to right. what so it's just right. like do do what you like Mm -hmm. enjoy it and as someone who like you were saying the pandemic got you out into a creative career i coming from the other side of or i've always been in a creative career mm -hmm. but i want to tell people like you can shift to another creative career like yeah. a lot of us feel we feel very blessed to be able to do this and we mm -hmm. feel like we're lucky and you're like but you can keep shifting and mm -hmm. like take your skills and keep going. So whether you're yeah. not in creative field and you want to get into it or you're in a creative field and you just want to try something new, like it's okay to make it. a change. Yeah. yeah. You should yeah. just be doing what you like. Um, mm -hmm. and like you said, put yourself out there. I will say I am horrible at that. Like <laughs> I do not share a lot of what I'm doing and that's actually my 2024 goal. That's is what to, you like, said. Yeah. Actually share what I'm doing. Um, well, I actually, and I will hold you accountable. You want to <laughs> see what please you're please creating. Do. Yeah. You no, know, I think it comes from being, again, doing hundreds and hundreds of shows. You're jumping from one show to the other. You don't have time to stop and take a picture and kind of like be like, how cool is this? You're like, mm -hmm. oh, it's done. It's on stage. Okay. What's the next on. thing I need to make? Yeah. yeah. So like, I'm hoping to share more and you're right. You never know who's watching and you never mm -hmm. know who's going to see it. And it might not be who you expect, but it leads right. to something really exciting. And yeah. Um, you I never feel know. comfortable when I'm outside of my comfort zone. Like when I'm, I think <laughs> you can get as a creative, you can get stuck and you can get mm -hmm. bored. And I will say I was getting a little, sewing was becoming a little bit boring for me. And mm -hmm. I think that's why during the pandemic, like trying fabric design, I wasn't sewing much other than making masks because I like needed a break. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this new job working with ditto and everything and educating has really like ignited that passion again. And like, now I want to sew every day and I'm super excited. So like, yeah. it's okay to like be mad at, <laughs> at your skills and be mad at, uh, you know, what brings you joy. It's, yeah. um, you can get it back. You might just have mm -hmm. to like go about it a different way. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, 
you finding this passion for teaching, you currently teach or are you currently teaching at Temple University? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, so. I teach uh, every spring semester um, so a pattern fun. and drafting class and um, the subject changes. It, so it kind of follows the students through. So I've had the same group of students basically for the last three years and a bunch of them are graduating in the next year or two. Um, but each Very class cool. kind of builds on their skills. So okay. the, uh, the first one you would take is just drafting and draping. So it's a lot mm -hmm. of draping for women's wear and then making that a pattern um, mm -hmm. and learning how to make mock-ups. And we end up with like a historical gown made out of muslin. It's kind of like wow. first class. And then last year was men's tailoring. So we made blazers. Um, wow. That's right up Ashley's aisle. Like mm -hmm. she would love you to like learn. All of, yeah, I do. She's really getting into that more and like has the books and studying it all. And she gets real nerdy about it. And I love it. <laughs> if you are a nerd. Like if you are a math nerd or you like. I'm not. Or you but, like And that's where I struggle. But yes, yeah, structure and interfacing and structured. pressing and oh, so fun. She likes the details of it. And yeah. I'm just like. Yeah. Quick and easy and dirty. I don't care. Well, yeah, if you, if you talk to us like uh, like last year, like if you said like, what do you prefer using? Like Bethany would say knits, and I'm like woven. Woven. <laughs> I'm a wo I'm a woven girl too. I'm making a change. Yeah, I am making and I think a change. I'm changing a little bit. I lately have been liking the knits, but I think it's now that I work from home. Like I like that comfort. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I prefer. I just don't like ironing. Woven. <laughs> my first my first garment that I'm releasing is a woven, so it's Very a little nerve-wracking. Cool. Nerve wracking. You'll get there. It'll be fine. Mine was um, a woven, but it was a circle skirt and it stretched with elastic, so yeah. <laughs> gathered. Yeah. yeah, it had it had stretch. So <laughs> it's really cool that you're teaching. I have to ask, um, have you ever considered like recording and putting out a full course? Mm -hmm. that people yeah. like an online course because i would be your first student <laughs> yeah i too. think well let's talk about it because maybe you'll have some ideas for me i, I think have ideas <laughs> I, I don't know how to go about it and i yeah. i don't know and i think a lot of us who post things on again i don't share a lot but i'm trying mm -hmm. so I, this year i'm going to put more on youtube little bit but i think you know a lot of us have that feeling of like well someone already has one out so like Oh, so, no, 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 no. What no, do no, I teach? No, no. And I know, okay. Ashley, you said it on your podcast before. You're like, whatever, you'll do it differently. You just put it out. So, and like, you're I'm you trying might, to you're, channel that. You might your relate to method, them more, too. Yeah. Everybody learns differently, mm -hmm. and your teaching method might resonate with yeah. other people that other methods don't. And at the end of the day, one thing that Ashley and I feel like we've really come to realize in the pattern designing, pattern drafting world is that no two companies put out. PDF patterns in the same method. Our, our size charts are different. Our grading rules are different. Our, our approach to patterns and instructions are different. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I feel like, you know, and we've, we've learned different methods on just drafting patterns from different resources. So there's no, there's so many different ways to get to the same end result. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think like for me, the one thing that I've struggled with in my learning this past year, you know, I love learning how to use Illustrator. I've loved learning how to create the digital files. My struggle is getting my 3D designs in my head into a flat pattern piece. I struggle with that transition from 3D to 2D. Mm -hmm. And um, the way we were taught in our course was to just design it right there in Illustrator without having done any sort of mock-up originally or draping or anything. And, and I went to school for fashion design. So it's like, that's how I learned was paper and dra and fabric draping and making paper pieces. We never learned the digital side because that was 20 years ago. Um, right, right, but right. but now I want to learn the digital side. It was side, Corel but it's Draw, just saying. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's how do we combine those two elements? And I realize I have, I can't drop the physical element of the design process because that is how my brain works, but it, that's not how way. we were taught. And so I think where you might be able, because you do the illustrator side too, but you do the draping side as well. It's like, how can you teach someone to 
to do both sides and bring up and bring them together. I feel like I could learn so much from you. Oh, and I know sure. I'm not the well, only that, one. Can we have private that lessons actually? Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm We're going to take this offline guys. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Um, like a no, new goal for 2024. <laughs> have Amanda I'm just, teach us I'm how to like sew. Total draper. Like I need yeah. to drape it. I I can flat pattern. I do not mm -hmm. like to. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how I do it is I drape it on the form. I make it into a paper pattern, and I take photos and then put it into Illustrator and, and then trace. start manipulating. Yeah. So I can totally make a video. <laughs> Do yes. Well, That's how I feel I like it could be it. a whole course and you and I yeah. will definitely, the three of us will talk offline because I, I feel like, and I told this to Ashley, when I learned this about you, just the smidge that I knew, um, is I was like, I feel like she knows more than I realize she knows. And she could be a really good resource. Like an I said, I'm a quiet one. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, I feel like when we went to convention in the fall for the Husqvarna Viking Epic three launch, you and I really got to spend more time together there and we got to know each other more. And I was like, there is so many more layers to the <laughs> onion that is Amanda that I want to get to know. So I was so excited when you said you wanted to be on the podcast because as coworkers, we only, right. We only know so much about each other. We, we really just mm -hmm. deal with work stuff together and you're not in Nashville. You're in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Like, oh, wow. Philadelphia. Closer yeah. than me. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, you know, I don't get to work with you beyond just work stuff. Mm. We don't get to build that rapport in the yeah. office kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, this has been fun getting to like, mm -hmm. know more about Amanda, who's <laughs> on my team, who I get to work more yeah. with now. So, I mean, we've done some ditto stuff together. So you do our ditto education. Yep. Um, so if you, we've talked about the ditto on here before and people have heard about it. It's the projector for um, sewing garments and sewing patterns. Um, it's a really cool, really cool device and really cool project that um, Singer and Joanne's partnered on to create. And so that's what brought Amanda on board. And so, but through that, I've gotten to know her, but then she's also been helping with some of our Singer stuff and she taught a mm -hmm. Michael's Zoom class. So a lot of our listeners know that I teach Michael's Zoom classes through Singer um, once a month, but we've been doing more of them this year. And that's so... Amanda did one yesterday, um, which was when this airs was a couple weeks ago, but she's doing a few for us this year and she did such a good job. She taught how to do um, yeah, mending that's... and altering on denim mm. and we had over 700 people sign up for this class wow. and it was so good and people were singing her praises and I was so proud and so many great questions and it's it's recorded so if you want to go watch the replay of her class it's over on michael's youtube channel so just search singer classes and over there and you'll see it but she did a fantastic job i'm just really proud of you coming out of oh. your shell and doing these things and um and it's, it's really fun to see you kind of grow this side of your passion mm -hmm. and yeah. educating and sharing your knowledge there is something very passionate about sharing what you know well i like that method. I like I think my style, I like to explain the why of it. Mm -hmm. um, like, this is why you do something, mm -hmm. not just like, here's how you do it. I think yeah. that mm -hmm. comes from like my sciencey brain. And also, I very much believe that if you understand why you do something or what the rule is, then you know how to break it. So mm -hmm. like, that is very much when I teach, I have a lot of students when I get the question, well, what if I just do this and I'm like no we are going to go through the process and you're going to learn how you are to do this because then you can go back and you can do it however you want once you understand mm -hmm. why you need to do that thing mm -hmm. um, so I'm very much of the like the first time you're sewing you should be there's a reason that the fabric a designer will tell you what fabric to use mm -hmm. there's a reason there are instructions like mm -hmm. follow that do that for your first one because yeah. if you don't you're going to waste fabric that you were excited about it's not going to turn out the way you wanted i'm going to get you're discouraged gonna disappointed exactly yeah. so like your first one we all know the first thing you sewed is absolute trash <laughs> uh <laughs> and that's okay like and you just keep at it and then mm -hmm. once you get you know more confident then you yeah. can hack things you can yeah do the wild stuff you can pick a fabric that maybe isn't correct because you like know how to handle it and how to shift it so like yeah 
I try to explain when I teach the why of everything. So then you can go on and do whatever you want with that information. Mm -hmm. Well, without having Um, that foundational knowledge, you don't have a baseline to work off of, right? Like you don't know what you don't know. Right. How I live by, like, you just don't know. Yeah. So (laughs) So it's those best practices, right? Mm -hmm. Of sewing, whether it's techniques and methods or even just caring for your machine and people hear me harp on that all the time so um yeah it's just really like this is why i really have encouraged people this year and we talked about it in a previous podcast of how important it is now that we're kind of post pandemic to get out there take an in-person sewing class even if it's at one of your local craft stores sign up for like a sewing one-on-one basics if you're new to it get to know your machine that way there's probably elements to your machine that you've never touched because you don't even know what they do and some people like creatives are do better by having someone sit and show them versus reading a manual that it comes with Mm -hmm. and i get that so i'm really encouraging people this year to go take an in-person class if you don't have one in your area sign up for one online because there's still those great resources but building that community of sewists in your in your area that you can connect with and join my sewing club or, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just, that's how you learn. Like I learned foundation paper piecing a couple months ago in my sewing club because we met and I really wanted to learn it. And one of the girls in the class, she, or in the club, she's really good at it. And so I printed off an easy pattern from Etsy and I brought the stuff and she showed me how to do it. And I don't know that I would have figured it out as quickly and as easily and enjoyed it if I hadn't had that one-on-one time with her to show me hands-on so there's still huge opportunities to connect with people in person and sew Mm -hmm. together and learn from each other so that's just I want to do that where I live now like I yeah because leaving the theater (laughs) world like I'm not with my costuming friends on a Mm day-to-day basis and I do miss that and now I you know two years ago moved out to the burbs and (laughs) I kind of want like you know, working from home, it can be very isolating. I was going like, to ask my you. My like, friends are far away. So has like, that been an adjustment of going from working into in a very hands-on creative shop with other creative people to kind of feeling very isolated in your sewing room? <laughs> well, I will, I will say as someone who is always and has been secretly shy, um, f- for me, it's, I, I enjoy it and I embrace it. Um, You're like an introverted I, extrovert, right? You're I one am, of those. Yeah. I am. That's the way I, I am too. I would say I'm that way too. I yeah. like my social outlets, but man, I really love just wearing house shoes all the time. Yeah. yeah. Going home. Well, and my husband works from home too. He's like across the hall and sometimes he'll come in and talk to me and I'm like, what? I'm working. Why are you in my space? <laughs> Get out. So, Only pets allowed. Only pets allowed. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it's definitely been an adjustment and I will say it's not as like magical, like some of that magic of like, wow, I work from home and I don't have to wear shoes, like wears off when you realize you're not with people. Yeah. So like I do, like I get excited for meetings now, like I, Mm. because I just want to talk to people. And I think now that I'm a little more settled in this job and I kind of know what I'm doing, um, I want to kind of, like you said, reach out to people locally Mm -hmm. who sew and kind of like build a base um, of people. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And I'm taking on more site work, like working for theaters I had worked in in the past and just building stuff for them, not necessarily Mm -hmm. designing, but building. So I get some of that social aspect and getting to talk about sewing um, Mm -hmm. with people face to face. (laughs) Yeah. There's something really fun about it. I mean, yeah. It's people who get you and like get what you're, you can like nerd out about. You speak our language. I was just going to say, you speak the same language. <laughs> you like, talking about much. like, are you a woven person or a knit? So you can't have that conversation with like, a lot of people. Like They're a like, basket? What? Like, are you weaving? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Cottons. Yeah, I agree. And What's so cottons? I think my last question for you, Amanda, unless Ashley has something else she wants to ask you is, you kind of harp like shared one of your goals for 2024, but with it being the beginning of the year, do you have any other goals that you are kind of considering or wanting to work towards this year as well? Maybe, maybe a course. Yeah. Maybe you need to write that one down. I know I need to shift that. <laughs> I, yeah. I think I, I want to produce more PDF patterns. So mm-hmm. I want to, you know, have more things out there, which you two know from being in, in it mm-hmm. deep that it is a lot of work. 
Yes. Um, so I want to yes. a lot of work. <laughs> so I want to I want to get more of that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, share more and yeah, educate more. And I think I just haven't decided how to go about it yet. Like a course seems daunting and it does. again, like a lot of work. <laughs> like Actually, I've talked about it. Don't eat the pizza at once. Just <laughs> one slice right, at a time. One day at a time. So I think right now, like for the first half of the year, I just want to, you know, get more on YouTube, mm-hmm. get more on Instagram, just show mm-hmm. people that yes, yes, I can teach you. Yes. Um, and then maybe yeah. second half of the year, I can start thinking about a course and well and uh, know that you have Ashley and I to tap into as like support like because Ashley and I've talked about doing courses but again it's like it's a lot of work but I think if you collaborate with the right people you can as a group a collective put your knowledge together to create Mm -hmm. something together so that might be an opportunity and then it may not feel so daunting to try to do it all by yourself and I think also this is something that I think a lot of people resonate with when you're in the creative world, you feel like an imposter, even <gasps> if you yes. are confident in your, like yesterday for that <laughs> Michael's class, I was nervous and I have hemmed millions of pants and I have <laughs> like literally half of working in a costume shop is fixing mm-hmm. holes because actors are really whole, hard on their clothes. I bet. Mm-hmm. But I was nervous because like, you're like, are, is someone going to tell me that I do it wrong? And then you're like, everything I've been oh, doing yeah. for the last, for sure. you know, so we all have imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. no matter what level you're in. And honestly, it's not until you do something like this, where you're talking about your skills that you're like, okay, I, th- I think I know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, m- maybe I have enough background yes. to rest on, but yes. I think we all go through it of that. Like, uh, well, maybe I, I don't. I like I just don't have the confidence to do it but you're right like I do we all have it we Mm -hmm. all have something to share and something and there's a million ways to do things so yes Mm -hmm. I will I will consider a course I will and how boring would it be if we already knew everything there was to know about sewing and you'll never know and we would move on and we wouldn't even do it so that's the other thing I always have to remind myself and I tell people that all the time is like Nobody know. No one person knows everything about sewing. Some and there's so many things you know it, then y- you shouldn't be doing this because exactly. like there but, is, you'll never learn it all. Well, and there's so many different ways of doing the same thing too. Like I may have mm-hmm. a different approach to this kind of seam and you may have a different approach to this kind of seam. And we, but as long as we end up with the same stitching result, like mm-hmm. again, there's two different, mm-hmm. but I knew my way, you knew your way and that's okay. So we could still learn a new way from each other to do the same thing. And that's cool. But I just, I, I have to remind myself a lot of times, like, okay, I don't know everything, mm-hmm. but because I don't know everything doesn't mean that I can't start working towards right. putting things out there yeah. with or what I do your know. way of doing it. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't and let I it will... hold me back or, ke- or use it as an excuse to not teach or mm-hmm. share um, because it can be that. very I'm overwhelming keep that in my brain of like, yes, I'll put it on a shirt. <laughs> that oh, you know, wear it. That's my costume. My whole YouTube <laughs> channel was based on, I learned something. I made a video. I, that was literally all yeah. I did was I would learn something and then I would be like, here it is. I didn't learn everything. And then, mm-hmm. okay, now I'm going to take pieces. I literally like, I just made this or did this like yesterday and now I'm teaching <laughs> you. <laughs> but you didn't know. <laughs> exactly. But you I know, I'm learning. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, but actually, you know, your patterns, you were like, gosh, I feel like I need to go back and redo some of my original patterns. Cause I've learned so much more now to make them even better. So you've even seen your growth over the last 10 or 11 years that you've had your YouTube, you know, I mean, again, we talked about this the other day of if you go and look at someone, if you have someone on Insta- on YouTube that you follow and their content is when their videos are like yeah. so good, perfectly edited, the great lighting, great cameras, great everything. If you go all the way back to their first few videos, mm-hmm. they weren't like that. They started just like everybody else. So you just got to start. Yeah. You can't yeah. grow and learn if you don't just start. So I'm trying to remember that. Like just, just start putting stuff out there. Just do see it. With sticks, honestly. Yeah. I feel like that's been my way with sewing like just see what sticks see what yeah. and w- if you like it that also matters it's not just mm-hmm. about if other yeah. people like it you have to enjoy it too mm-hmm. um and you're allowed to shift throughout the process yes. like my sure. yeah. my little company it's called cotton stitches co like started as an etsy shop selling pajamas 
And then Hmm. it shifted Mm -hmm. to more or less stickers because I was like in a graphic design fabric phase. And now I'm trying to get more PDF patterns. So you can shift as you go. That's the way it Um, goes. Nothing stuck forever. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of us, especially our generation, we feel like we have to know what we want to be when we grow up and we have to stick to that for our entire career. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I'm turning 40 this year. And I'm like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I'm over here trying to help my kid who's graduating and going off to college, figure out what he wants to be when he grows up. And I'm like, I feel like I'm the last person that should be giving you (laughs) advice right now, but I'm your mom. So this is what I know. Yeah. I haven't even made it yet. (laughs) I know. And I'm I told, I think, I keep telling him, I'm like, look, whatever you want to do, I'm going to support, you know, like he's got a creative side, but he's also very analytical. So he's doing computer programming, but, and that's a world I do not understand. So I'm supporting him in any way that I can, but I'm giving him permission to try things Mm -hmm. that he doesn't have to have it all figured out. If he gets in there and decides this is not what I want to do. Okay. Like don't force yourself to stick with it just because you had this focus for years and that's what she, and that's what amanda did right you decided mm-hmm. you took the chance to yeah. drop out which so many would be like oh i'm afraid to you know upset my parents or maybe oh, my parents were bad upset. Decisions. don't worry <laughs> oh for sure but the fact that you were just like i don't really care like i don't want to do this anymore like that's but you got to trust the process and where your gut is te- what your gut is telling you where your heart is putting pulling your attention mm-hmm. and your focus um, the talents that you were, you know, you were given. So I just, I- I'm glad that I was forced out of a rut of doing the same thing that I had been doing for so long so that I could find a balance between like a corporate job and a creative space. Mm-hmm. And I was telling my boss this yesterday. I said, um, I said, I want you to know that as someone who comes from corporate but never had the creative aspect of it, I do not take this opportunity for granted because I have some of the stability and, and consistencies Mm -hmm. that come with having a corporate job, but also having the creative aspect of my job gives me that good balance for the personality type that I I have no stability. (laughs) I have a variable paycheck. Not fun. Yeah. But it, and, but I've been there too, right? Yeah. We've all, you both like, make it work. So every yeah. day can work. You just Husband have to like, makes it work. want to make it work. <laughs> that's okay. Like, that's, that's a way to go about it. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> get a, yeah. Just get a rich I husband. think, I think the biggest message <laughs> that I've taught my son though, is that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be one way. You can create yeah, your own sure. way. Let's choose your um, own adventure. It and is. you can change your mind. You can yeah. change your mind. You can do something different. You can use those skills and apply them to something else. Yep. And like, like I'm very thankful for this job now. And mm-hmm. I like, I'm like, I love where it's taking me. And I <laughs> feel like I'm actually connecting with people a lot more because like, mm-hmm. I like educating and I like mm-hmm. spreading that knowledge and mm-hmm. getting people hyped about sewing. It's nerdy, but it's exciting. It like, I love it though. <laughs> yeah, I do. Well, that's awesome. Well, I'm so glad that you came and hung out with us today and I got to know you better. And now I'm like, how do I get Amanda to come visit the office and spend some time and we can sew together in person? We've never gotten to do that. That would be super fun. Maybe there needs to be a singer project where like two people have like it's I don't know. <laughs> we're going to collect. We're going to I'll see what strings I can pull. Because I think we would have so much fun like drafting and yeah. mm-hmm. creating and yeah. We'll see what happens. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I'm glad we could be your first podcast. I know. <laughs> well, right, I hope guys. I inspired and excited people. Yes. So. <laughs> you definitely have. And for those that are listening in the description and over on our website, you'll see links to Amanda's socials, mm-hmm. her websites, her spoon flower fabric design. You've got to go check those out. Um, her Etsy shop, her pattern shop, all the things that she's doing and all the things that she's going to be doing this year. Yeah, We're going to encourage her to share her knowledge because she has a lot of it. And we just appreciate you hanging out with us today. And of course, our listeners, just be sure to know that you can sign up for our newsletter so you're in the know of everything we're working on. So go to our website and sign up for that. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have that over there. We love to get your comments on our podcast every week over on our YouTube. And until Mm -hmm. next week, happy sewing. Bye. Bye.